my name is Emma and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. Today I am going through all of the questions that I've been asked previously. Got a plant under me that I've not answered before and I think all of the questions will probably apply to lots of people because I feel like whenever people have questions it tends to be not just the question of one person. So I'm going to try and answer a few questions and it might seem a bit random but I think it will give you like a general idea of um, what I do or what I have done on my placements, what I did on my course, what I do now. Um, just in case you don't know I'm a speech therapist working in London uh, in a hospital at the moment. So that gives you some context um, and I'm just going to go through some questions. So. The first one is from Maria. Did I find it difficult to find a job as an SLT and how did I find mine? So in the UK, we have a system um, for NHS jobs. So that's the National Health Service. And there's a website called Track Jobs, which generally all of NHS jobs go onto that website. Um, so that is how I found my jobs in the NHS. They're also often um, jobs on LinkedIn and in general other like job websites which I can't think of right now but I'll just add in below um, and so I found my jobs on track jobs and on there it's quite good because you can select your profession what banding you are so if you're a newly qualified SLT you come in as a band 5 in the UK and then you could select your location too so if you're looking for jobs you can look in the area Personally, I didn't find it hard to find a job in paediatrics. There tends to be a few more jobs in paediatrics rather than in adults. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why that is, but there do tend to be. So I did, I th oh no, I applied for one job uh, in paediatrics before the job that I got. And there are jobs out there in the UK, like I think speech therapists are quite in demand and although there aren't enough jobs for the work there are enough jobs for the speech therapists so that is good and like I said found mine through track jobs and then you interview through there and it's all kind of organized through there through your employer ah uh, some of these messages are so lovely thank you and I'm sorry I'm not replied but I do see them and they are really really lovely <laughs> on my how to apply for the course someone said um, I'm taking notes if I don't get it I'll blame you yep fine <laughs> about interview experience or any tips I would recommend I think it, again for UK specifically in the NHS they have kind of like a checkbox um, so when you ask questions about certain things you need to cover say certain keywords that they tick off or certain subjects um, so that's good to know just generally as a whole if you're applying for NHS jobs another general tip that I've got is to research the trust values and kind of how you relate to the trust values so in the UK the NHS has different trusts so for example there's like Portsmouth Trust I don't actually know what they're all called I'm trying to think of any but I can't um, but they're all trusts which are basically areas um, of yeah in the NHS and they have different values and so um, in your interview you're always asked about them um, so it's good to have an idea of what they are and kind of how you will uphold those values the next thing I think is very good to know is kind of if you can think of a bit of a not think of but like why why you came into it what your experience is and why that relates to the job you're going for and why you want the job you're going for that's a question that always seems to come up Another one is about EDI, so equality, diversity and inclusion. And I think it's important to speak about it from a personal perspective, um, from a professional perspective in terms of your patients and also with colleagues as well, kind of what you can do or what you want to do um, to make yourself more aware of that. Um, and be supportive of everyone of different religions, race, genders, etc. I think that's another important one. And there's also questions that tend to be on case. So case-based questions. So they'll be like, 
there's a gentleman who's 63 who's come in with blah 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 what would you do for an assessment or what would you do for therapy for example so I think that's like a kind of from the top of my head what one what kind of questions come up and good things to cover I'm sure they apply to other places out of the UK as well but obviously that is my experience is NHS specific interviews um, but yeah so thank you for that question someone asked what I chose for my A levels so when I did my A levels it was I think different a bit different to now we chose four AS levels and then three of them we turned into A levels so I chose four in my first year of college or sixth form when I was 16 um, and I chose biology English language psychology and photography and then I dropped my biology and then I had English language psychology and photography as my pure A levels and at this point I didn't know I wanted to do speech therapy so yeah um, that was because I liked psychology was the main one I wanted to do and English I enjoyed and photography I really enjoyed so that's why I chose that talk more about how I got onto shadow following following shadowing slash volunteering experience when I did my undergraduate degree I did it in psychology and on that I did some volunteering for the Alzheimer's Society and that's kind of where I heard about speech therapy um, and how they kind of supported people with Alzheimer's with communication I got a bit of experience and then from then I vo also volunteered in a preschool in the preschool there were children with like learning disabilities a child with down syndrome so it's kind of just exposure to working with children which I had done before I think it's good to get kind of exposure to settings as well so if you've done TA TAing is that a thing um, then you've got exposure to that and kind of if you can do a session with a speech therapist even if you could just watch I think that's really good just to get like a general idea of what they do and then also I um, uh, shadowed speech therapists in a hospital um, in Northampton oh and then I also shadowed a community speech therapist in another hospital near Portsmouth um, but I was lucky enough to kind of have um, people who either worked there or knew people who worked in those places so that's how I did it so use your connections if you not get any connections definitely email find speech therapists managers emails on the NHS websites etc but yeah to email and say can I come for a day of shadowing can I try that I also kind of tied in I did some volunteering in an orphanage in Kenya and even then it was kind of working with children uh, and adults with a language just because of the language barrier it didn't necessarily mean they had any lang language difficulties or speech difficulties but if you can link any experience you've got to speech therapy and how it kind of could relate a lot of mine were volunteering and I did work full-time in a pub for a bit but also I was fortunate enough to live at home which was much cheaper um, than living say in London or having to pay for rent etc so I was very lucky in that sense to be able to then then volunteer. I also did a city lit course actually which was I think it was two days um, if you google city lit they do a speech therapy like um, information for, about speech therapy and I think city lit are kind of tied to city university which is in London which is the university I went to um, and that was I think it was about £100 at the time for two days which again quite a lot of money but it was kind of me working out what I wanted to do so that kind of helped as well so yeah um, what are the questions on on placement how much SLT did you carry out I think it means like maybe more like independently is what I'm assuming but on my first placements I did much less independently I started to do communication assessments etc independently towards the end um, but to be honest I was very nervous on my first placement and it was during Covid and things like that and I think I didn't really back myself so I didn't I wasn't feeling too confident then and then depending on the placement you were given more responsibility um, depending on I guess how confident you were feeling how confident they were in you and also it depends on the practice educator if they sometimes if they 
prefer you shadowing or they prefer you doing then that makes a difference as well we weren't paid or anything uh, on it so I don't know if that kind of is what the question is like were you working as an SRT on placement we weren't working um, we were students uh, but we did have to demonstrate that we could do assessments um, therapy but obviously we just had more support to do everything and we had to sign off certain competencies on each placement to show that we were competent enough to pass that placement and and I guess one good example is when I was working in I said working when I was on placement in schools I had much more I would say independence to create session plans and do it than I did in Evelina's Children's Hospital because obviously the setting is hugely different so I would go and on, in Evelina's there'd be quite medically unwell babies and a lot of it would be dysphagia which I wasn't trained in and even for communication you know I'm not going to do communication with the baby um, with lots of different like tubes and things in that weren't well enough to do it so a lot of that was more like I was looked after more there um, whereas in schools it was a bit more like you know I could run some groups just with observation and I do some therapy with children etc etc so this one is what work like life balance is it like in SLT do you do much overtime slash work in your own time or are you given enough time for reports and prep I think this really depends on the place I think and the person too I think obviously they both play a role but on my placements, there were some times where I had to do additional work outside if I wanted to do a lesson plan or, or, or a report or something. But to be honest, even it was quite rare. But I don't know if that's because my placement practice educators were more aware of how much other things we had to do or of how long things would likely take a student because I know some of my friends they worked like really really hard outside of their placements as well and that's when we're meant to be doing our studying etc as well and obviously doing a bit of overtime here and there is okay but I know some of them worked really extra hard on placements and do in their jobs too and take it home with them and I think often if you're able to work from home then it comes home with you and then extra work can be done at home and I think so I think it can not be great but it also can be good um, in both of my jobs I have not worked outside of working hours I occasionally work half an hour late here or there um, and I would stay late if I wanted to get something sorted that was urgent and had to be done that day um, especially in hospital if it was something more like clinically risky or I would you know I'd feel like oh no this could happen if I don't do that then it's worth it but on the whole I don't and also in this current job I'm really encouraged to if I stay later then to take the half an hour back another time um, which is very lovely and by the sounds of it quite different to teaching um, and things like that where I know they come into work very early so I do my 8.20 to 4.20, occasionally get later trains home, if either I'm a bit slow, I would just want to finish something off, but then normally I'm encouraged to take it back too, obviously you don't always take it back because you're like well, you know, it's one of those things, but on the whole I think it depends on the place and I personally think you should be strict and set your boundaries and not get into the habit because it's so easy to get stuck in the habit of it. Hmm, and more details on my placements. Um, I think I'm going to do a whole video on my placements but this one says especially Evelina's hospital if you can so there is a very specialist children's hospital in the centre of London and it's Guys and St Thomas's which is very well quite prestigious and famous I think in the UK I don't know if it's famous anywhere else and there a lot of what they were doing was dysphagia based speech therapy so swallowing with lots of children who were born prematurely um, or with birth defects or were acutely unwell which meant then I don't know they had to have something done which meant that they were a bit behind on their swallowing etc and just making sure their swallowing is safe and they're not going to get chest infections etc um, so that was a lot of the work which we 
couldn't really do independently but a lot of observations also interesting such specialist therapists and they were all amazing and so impressive and so bright and smart and just yeah very inspirational and then also communication a lot of it were again like i said babies so the communication is like really early signs of communication and kind of trying to work and encourage parents to work on those kind of early communication strategies because these children are in a hospital with like beeps everywhere bright lights you know it's not an optimal learning environment for a baby so it's kind of it was a lot of what we did was working with early communication strategies with parents and with the children um, to encourage their communication to progress as as it should typically um, or if it wasn't progressing typically which likely it wouldn't in hospital then that's okay many of you have you know said oh I've just got on the course or or I'm just about to start in your first time job it's so exciting ah someone said is there a way to become a speech and language therapist without going to uni? Could I become assistant and train my way up? It's a really difficult path because I have rent to pay and uni's three hours away. Do you know a way around it? I know that's coming in, but I don't think it's been actioned anywhere yet. So there is going to be a speech therapy, oh, what's it called? Basically, like you learn on the job and you go to uni at the same time, but that is gonna come in. But I reckon they'll be very, very competitive and they'll likely go to speech therapy assistants that are already in post and want to do that. So I would look for those kind of jobs if that's what you're wanting to do. Also, because it's so new, I don't think it's going to be ruled out really fast. So in terms of other universities in the UK, so I know there's two in London, there's City University and UCL that do the Masters. I know City University also do the undergraduate BSc and I think Greenwich does as well. And there's one in Kent, there's one in Sheffield, there's one in Newcastle. Mm, so there are a few, but I would Google them because I'm not hand sure. Someone saying they're suffering from the IPA chart. Yep, literally everyone struggles with that, I think, unless you love it. Um, or it just clicks with some people, but I wasn't one of those either, so don't worry. You're not in it alone. <laughs> Is that a ghost I see? Is that I'm like, guys, it's so lovely. How many contact hours did you have? We weren't in uni nine to five every day. We had a placement day a week. So I think it's probably like full four full days in Gleeling placement. It's like nine to five, I think, from what I remember. And I think we had a bit online, whereas now I think it's all gone back to in person. One of them says, do you ever work on anxiety with kids and adults? That is not our area of expertise. However, I think sometimes it kind of comes as part of it so we could advise based on anxiety around speech therapy and building confidence and um, or if it's anxiety around swallowing then we would also get psychology involved but obviously our, we've got a bit of a role too because it's determining whether it is psych fully psychological or if there is something going wrong which is why something psychological um, so we don't directly deal with anxiety but and we'd always get the professionals involved that are needed, but I think it does kind of sometimes come into it a bit. So I want to ask what placements I had. So I started off in a hospital in London in an acute and stroke role because the my practice educator, who's the person that's in the placement um, working there, who looks after the students, um, rotated between acute and stroke. So I got both, which was really good. And then I worked in a school well, maybe I didn't do that then. Then I worked in Evelina's Children's Hospital. Then I worked in a school. I say worked. These are all my placements. Then I worked in a main, mainstream schools, going from school to school. And then I went work, was on placement in prison. So I had some really good, really, really, really good placements. Someone said, do you know anyone with foreign accent being in SLT? Yes, yes. Um, one of my seniors is French speaking. She's got a slight accent. Not huge accent, but there's lots of people on the course that had um, different accents. So, absolutely. Do you need to be good at STEM to do well in speech, language and hearing sciences? Linguistics in university? No. Well, it would help, but they teach it to you all. So, if you're open to learning and willing to give it a go, I think you'll be fine. Okay, I think that's everything. So, thank you so much for watching. 
um, I really appreciate it and if you could give it a like and subscribe that would be great, bye!